to another episode of the monkey business show i would like to say that before we started the podcast kyle again asked me how much he's getting paid uh, I did not so, do that. yes you did and mira hello what's up how are you hey, doing long time no talk jay i hope everything is well yeah yeah it's been it's been a very long time i heard that you actually even came to my city without me being here so disrespectful i did i did i mean i wanted to see you but i heard you were stuck in singapore because you were sick I was going to say, I end up making it to Singapore. I cannot say everything, the same thing about all casters, but no, no. yes, obviously we have a lot of things to talk about. And Kyle, um, dude, what's happening on the back behind your room? Let me see. Uh, I'm in like my other room where people stay. So I don't know. There's like stuff everywhere. Well, how have you been? Both of you. I haven't talked to you. I think that the last show that we did where we talked about life was pretty successful. And I think that we're, we're due, you know? For another life talk with Effie and Kyle. I definitely miss the life talks. I feel like that a lot has happened since then. Um, well, I mean, the biggest thing that I've been through recently was TI, right? But okay. I think all things considered, uh, it went very well. Uh, I know Kyle's got some nice life updates too. Don't mm, you? Okay. <laughs> Why do you look confused? Well, what, what what category of life updates? No, it's like okay. a wide swath. Well, we were talking about like overall happiness in our last podcast together. And That's I true. know that you've been happier these days. So, I mean, if I'm wrong, That's I true. guess I don't know. I'm trying well, to think of like what obviously the I can't changes speak were. for Kyle being happy. I thought he was happier. With, I, I would say, yeah. I mean, I've done, I've done, um, there's a good line. I think I've told it to both of you. That's always stuck with me. Which is, um, if you're so smart, why can't you be, why aren't you happy? And I've been trying to optimize and like think about being more intentional about my life. I think a big part of that is having, is spending more time with people because against my will, I'm an extrovert. Uh, so it's really nice having you back in town, Jay, because you're like incredibly extroverted. Incredibly extroverted. Um, you're also what? surprisingly oh. more extroverted than you would think. Maybe not extroverted, but definitely more social. But she's got to like warm to you first. You know what I mean? So you were saying that obviously the big updates was TI for you. So how how was the journey of Mira and TI? The journey of Mira and TI, it was it was kind of a roller coaster for me. Uh, it started off bad, then it had some high points, and then it was bad for me personally, and then it was really good. And I I think I ended up feeling pretty well about everything that happened. So. For the most part, um, I'm like very happy with how everything turned out. In That's regards the most to TI, cryptic, so. cryptic answer I've heard in a very long time. <laughs> you could just said you hold yourself to the fifth, and it will be the same thing, you know. Okay. I mean, I mean, obviously the circumstances of that event make it like flip flop between good and bad, right? Okay, so you say you're not enjoying casting at four a.m. in the morning. I, I'd say that I've had better times okay. <laughs> throughout my career. Mira, let me tell you, sleep-deprived Mira, totally different person from a Mira who has sleep. Mm. How is uh, sleep-deprived Mira? Griping the, the, increases the by like 10x. No, no, no. It's like, it's just life. <laughs> life suddenly is, is all darkness. Although, to be fair, Norway was primarily darkness. I think there's I, like four hours of sunshine. I, I would say that, no, sleep deprivation is part of the job and you get used to it. So it's not that much about sleep deprivation as it is like not seeing the sunlight it definitely affects me very strongly if i don't get you know a daily dose of sunshine and just because we were working so early in the morning there wasn't any of that so i found that keeping my mood up was pretty difficult but having everybody else around experience the same thing made it kind of a, a group bonding activity you know and it became less bad how early would you wake up every day man <laughs> Well, so there were two makeup artists in the studio and we had two separate shifts. So Shiva and I, obviously we take longer to get our makeup done and we were starting off the day. So she and I would wake up at midnight and we would get to the studio. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> we would uh, get to the studio around 1230 after we would eat and we would 
get our makeup done and would be finished around two. And then the boys would come in, uh, Lacoste and Jenkins, and they would finish around 3.15 ish. <clears throat> and then we'd just get mic'd up, talk about the pre show, and the show would start at 3 30 a.m. I was so, ready to tell you how my life is awful when I'm in LA because I wake up every day at four. But you dunk on me. I was ready yeah. to just to dunk on you, but no, I got dunk midnight. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, I had my own. Ex I only did an overnight land once. It was the MDL Paris major from LA with the BTS guys, and I swore I'd never do it again. Because I, I I like to think I'm a pretty like warm and friendly person, and I was I wouldn't I wasn't rude, but I was not happy, and that one that one almost killed me. Man, that was rough. I can't, I can't do it. I think I need the sunshine. I would go back with lyrical. It It'd be like eight or nine a.m., and we'd be like, "Well, guess it's time for bed." Okay. Bright sun coming so down I was on top say, of me. The next Oof. question is, what time do you normally go into bed? Uh, at TI. Yes. So obviously, like we would want to watch the matches for the entire day. So when that was over, um, the eating schedule is kind of strange because our shift would end around nine in the morning. And we would want to go back and have dinner, but breakfast is being served. <laughs> Do you know what so I mean? So you will go to bed after eating dinner at 9 a.m. in the morning. No, we would watch the rest of the game. So I think okay. the games would usually go on until um, around 1 <clears throat> in the afternoon. And... And we would just kind of stay up a couple of hours and do the prep for the next day and just go to bed. So I was going to sleep around 3 p.m. on work days. So 3 p.m. Yeah. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So that would be eight hour, nine hours of sleep. Yeah, the, the sleep was fine, right? Because we were on the schedule the entire time. It The issue for me was just because our schedule was essentially upside down, everything about it was weird. So not seeing the sun was weird. Having breakfast for dinner was weird. Uh, having it be, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's kind of hard to explain, but it feels like you're in a little bubble because all you can do, even when you're done with your shift, because you're too tired to like leave afterwards, you feel like you're just in this small bubble of studio to hotel, hotel to studio, studio to hotel. So it was a very uh, interesting experience to say the least. But so I mean, I have honestly, honestly, with, with all of that being said, part of it was really interesting because there were around 40 people working in the studio. It was a professional AR studio, and it was really interesting to see how committed and how dedicated those people were when it comes to putting on the best show. So for me, it was a whole different experience broadcasting with a studio that has nothing to do with esports. So okay. it was just cool how it felt like everybody was in it together. You know, I've never felt that sense of teamwork before at a Dota event. I, when I did movies, I remember when we were, when we do nights, you have to keep always like 12 hours turnaround. So when we did nights, we always group nights together. So you will do one whole week of nights. And we normally started like, let's say at 6 p.m. And it goes until, let's say, 7 a.m. And I saw my mind just going away. Because by the time I came at 8 a.m., there's no chance I will go to sleep. The, mm -hmm. the city has a different vibrant energy during the day. You can hear cars, you can hear neighbors, you can hear these things. And then the sun is up. There's no chance I could go to bed. I will need like a completely black room with the AC and completely uh, sound canceling shit pillows, you know, for me to sleep. And even then, I couldn't sleep. So I felt the deterioration of my mind day after day after day. And I remember the last day of the movie, it was like, fuck this. I don't care about <laughs> anything anymore. There's nothing you can tell me that I will give two shits about it. Oh, there is a whole track on fire. It's okay. Shit happens at 6 a.m., you know? <laughs> That's it. Oh, well, one of the extras is not... It's okay. It's okay. Shit happens, you know, at 6 a.m. Like, at one point, is you just stop caring. You felt that way. Yeah. <laughs> Stop I mean, trying to get her in trouble, Jay. <laughs> no, that's. I don't think you can get in trouble talking about your experiences, right? But, but it's okay. It, Kyle is your lawyer, friend, and lawyer. <laughs> don't don't answer that yeah. question. Great. No, I mean honestly, the issue for me was, it, it wasn't that there wasn't time to get sleep. There there was always time to get sleep. It was just very difficult for people to fall asleep when they were supposed to, because yep. your body is just not used to sleeping when the entire world is ready to get its day started or is already going with its day. It just feels very unusual. But honestly, 
having the the four days or five days in between the finals and the playoffs it really helped like i think that if we didn't have that break i probably would have snapped at some point but then during that days what are you doing are you having normal life or you continue to stay on the weird schedule so you don't break the schedule you're still on the weird schedule (laughs) well you we tried to keep the weird schedule like i i tried to but because we had two separate shifts, like panel one and panel two. Um, panel two slept later than us, and they were always like doing activities in the afternoon. And sometimes we would want to go ahead and tag along with them. So on those cases, we would, you know, go hard and stay up late and come back at six p.m. Okay, wow. <laughs> we went super hard. <laughs> so we 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 tried a bunch but, of yeah. dorks. <laughs> So I mean, it I is think what it is. <laughs> Kyle and I have a great bunch of stories as well that many of them can be shared. I think that this year for me, having the week uh, between the group stage, well, the main stage and the finals for us in Singapore was one of the coolest things for us mm-hmm. because we have 90% of the teams already not playing, which means that we have all the players there, all the casters there, hanging out, having fun, sharing experiences. And I had some of the my most fun times since I joined Dora. I will go out partying with Toronto, Tokyo, Mira, Kyle, uh, the, all the South American players. We had so much fun together and you will yeah. have, you can go to the pool and just chill because there's nothing else you can do. There's nothing, nothing to do for a week. I'm so happy for you. Yeah. I can feel how happy you are for me. <laughs> I mean, that sounds really great. I'm not jealous at all. You know, I had fun. It's, it's like when people say like, it's horrible for the format. I was like, it might be horrible for the format. It was great for us. <laughs> no, um, I, I definitely heard some stories coming from people who are at Singapore. And they said that the break in between was the best part about the entire event. It was amazing. Being able to socialize with everybody. So honestly, while there may be some issues with the format with the players, I don't think that in the future, a two or three, two or three day break would be bad at all. There's usually a one day break anyway in TI. I mean, extending it to potentially two days in the future. I I think it's really bad for people that are still working TI. Mm. People that are working TI, this break is awful for the players, for the casters and all that. But for everybody else that is just chilling in an event, it's great. TI5, we had like a three day break, if I'm not mistaken, um, between Mm. groups and main event. I think so. I think it really just depends on venue more than anything else. But yeah, Singapore, Singapore was a lot of fun. That uh, Friday night, yes. we had um, we had a large group of Dota people uh, at a really famous club in Singapore that had like some DJ performing, um, and it was just this like corner of the second floor that was just taken over by Dota. It was really cool, and I think in general it's just really nice to have. I put it. I had a great time. I got a lot of love from people that I hadn't seen in some in a, in a long while. So I left feeling very warm. And then uh, when I returned to Los Angeles, I had COVID. So that was a big downside. But then I quarantined for six days and it was all good. The so end. Kyle, talk, talk to me a little bit about it because obviously you've been away from the Dota scene mostly for a while. Mm. And I know personally you and I have spoken about it was. Maybe you were sad because you be belonging, you belong to this community for so long and you mm. were in a way having a little bit of, let's say, identity crisis because Swindle mm. Melon was a big part of who you were. And since you left Dota, you're just being Kyle. And I think you've been Kyle for all of us, but you go back to, let's say Dota Kyle, mm. and then you see your old buddies and your old people. And you said that you felt a lot more love maybe that you were expecting. Mm-hmm. I... I think I, because because TI is just where everyone shows up, right? And I think I underestimated the number of people there that I've known for so long. Because it's not just the, the the players or the talent, but also like the people that that work behind the scenes with the teams that like work for different brands or production companies within. Um, and there were people that I hadn't seen in some time. Like you just resolution and um and his girlfriend are two of my favorite people. And they were going to Bali after the event. And it turned out that another good friend of mine, a guy named Charlie and his wife were going to Bali. They were on the same plane together. And I was like, oh my God, you guys are going to be best friends. And they like went to dinner and did this whole thing. So I I really enjoy bringing people that I love together. But the after party specifically, 
was really cool because I, you know, how you just kind of you do Sorry, like the circuit. You just went blurry. The moment that you said after party, your camera just went blurry. It's amazing. Just this like my memory. I was going to say represent, <laughs> an accurate representation of Kyle Knight. Mm -hmm. But so, so I always bounce around. So you do like a circuit, right? And you just kind of walk through the room and say hi to all the people. <laughs> and I walked in and it took me, I, I looked at my watch at a point and I had completed my first circuit. It took like two hours. And there were all these people that, you know, you just sit, catch up with for like five, 10 minutes. I had a really cool talk with, um, with snaking and fogged. Because me and Snaking are in this like you know meme video together, and and they were him and Fogger asking like what were we even arguing with each other about? Like what what were we talking about in that in this video where I'm like going off on Snaking? Because it's like 12 years ago. It, it was just it was just crazy because neither one of us could remember. And it's wild to see Snake because I still see Snaking to an extent. Insania is the same. I see them as kids because when I first knew them, I was like 18 years old. They were like 15 and, and 16. And all of a sudden, we're all adults and we're like in careers. And it's just wild to see how it's like nothing has changed. But to, to circle it all back, this is why I think Dota is going to forever be like my family. Like maybe we all would move on from the game at some point. I don't think we're going to keep playing when we're 40 or 50. But this is our community. This is our culture. This is like who we grew up with in a lot of ways. I don't have many friends in life that I've known for more than a decade. 97% of them come mm. from Han and Dota. You, that, that's, at this point, there's no other old friends I can make. That is pretty special. And there, there is something about having friendships that stand the test of time, even if they aren't your closest friends. Just knowing that somebody you talked to, you knew 10 or 11 or 12 years ago, it does mean a lot and it does carry a lot of weight. And if you grew up gaming and on the internet, you obviously have a handful of those friends. Um, I still talk to a lot of my old friends from Dota 1. I used to play on this. <laughs> I used to play on this client called RGC. I mean, I'm sure some people are going to remember it. And it was it was such a small community compared to G Arena. But basically, everybody knew everybody. And I actually met two lifelong friends that I still talk to to this day from that place. So That's I amazing. think Dota is really cool when it comes to that kind of thing. For me, it was the first time I felt that I was part of this community because I never really felt part of, of this community because maybe my age or my position or like I've been COVID CEO for most of the time. And I don't, I, don't, I was not a player. I was not a talent. I, I didn't go through like some of these, but I think I've done enough where people were finally recognizing me and like accepting me, you know, like in a way I pay my dues. I ate glass like everybody else mm -hmm. for a few years. Mm -hmm. And now I'm part of it. And I found so many cool moments with, for example, Marple and her husband. Oh, Super cool. Them. Both of them were awesome. And they came to talk to me and we were like talking shop and talking content. And some of the casters and talent, like they felt that we've been doing in OG a lot of really cool things for the, for the ecosystem with the show and the content and all that. So I had a lot of complimentary moments. And yeah, I, uh, in a very, very small scale, what you're saying is something that I've seen because there's people that I've already been dealing with for four or five years. And these people have become some of them part of my life. So yeah, I feel that the hardest thing was, Mira, I still have never met you in person. And <laughs> you guys were all left out, I'm sorry, from all this social celebration of our community. And that was in a way very, very bad for you guys and very sad. Because there was no work. It was more like, hey, I actually get to experience this with Chris Luck. And I went to a karaoke, you know, or some mm -hmm. of these things. It was like, dude, this guy is just like me, you know? Yeah, I'm maybe 10 years ahead of him. But mm -hmm. this guy was exactly who I was at 26. And he's exactly very similar to what I am right now. And you, I got to humanize a little bit more of everybody there. Mm -hmm. I got to feel who they are as people and feel what they are about. And it made me really feel more positive about my whole feelings regarding the community. Because in a way, the price pool being down so much is in a way like an indicator of health of the community. But no, it's not. I, I actually think that it's not. And mm -hmm. yes, it went down, but the players are more friendly than they've ever been. The community is more excited to do things that they've ever been. The funding of the player numbers are going up, not down. Like, I feel very, very loved and very, very happy with where we are. And that sounds so nice. We got to do a lot of like uh, 
shows because we did eight shows in nine days of a monkey business show. The coolest thing I've ever done because we had fans there. We had like 450 uh, people that wanted to come every day of list and we could only bring the say 60 to 80. So we couldn't bring, you know, a lot of people and we try to rotate them. So new people will come and after every show, we'll stay there for 30 minutes to one hour. We took photos with everybody. We signed things with everybody. And you guys were, were on the other side of the world. Didn't even see a lot of the things that we did at TI because we had like a OG store in the mall where everybody will go eat. And we didn't even promote it because on purpose, we were going to bring Johan and Seth for a signing sessions to promote it. But the fans kind of found it before we were <laughs> opened. So there was a huge line before it opened the first day and we sold out everything the first six hours, That's seven crazy. hours. <laughs> and we sold like a, a thousand, three hundred pieces of merch in the first few, few hours. And then it just became a place to hang out and we were there and Topson was there and Johan was there. Like there was a lot of touch points that we had with fans. And then there was the oh. uh, secret lab facility. And then there was the steel series thing. So the moment that you come to TI, steel series build a huge, let's say uh, activation. And we were part of the activation and they brought the ages and people took photos. I don't know. It's just, it fell for the first time, like the festival that we've been missing for a few years. That and sounds quick, awesome. Quick shout out as well to uh, Mawar, Thompson's wife. Yeah. Awesome. Absolutely awesome person. But more importantly, I didn't have a ticket for the finals. <laughs> and then she came out and gave me a ticket at like 2 p.m. Yeah. I had a, I had a ticket until 3 and I had to give it back to somebody. But she uh, she allowed me to watch Tundra. Um, just kind of This is the first time you yeah. met Mawar? Yeah. Mawar is fucking awesome. I don't know. If you, have you met yeah, her? Yeah, uh, no, I actually haven't been to that many uh, Dota uh -huh. events where people go to. <laughs> I, I've been a COVID talent and a, a mm. Norway talent. I've only been to one uh, LAN event, which was ESL1 in Malaysia, which was really oh, cool. Oh, that's the one but, that I didn't go. Okay. Um, but I mean, given that I've been working a year and a half and I've only been to one LAN event, that's very sad. But I'm honestly glad that it was that much fun, the way that you guys describe it. I wish I could have been there, but I'm glad that it was a good experience for people who were there. Maybe yeah. next year. <laughs> Hopefully next year. Hopefully. But... So I think that one of the things that Kyle just was telling that, so Mawar is Topson's wife and we are all friends. Like this, the OG family, it's very funny. Mm -hmm. When we rolled to the club, it was all the OG family together, you know? Yeah. It was Johan, uh, his friends and his family, his sister. And then it was Seb and me and Topson and his wife. We all rolled in the OG bubble <laughs> and... It was very funny because I haven't really been partying or spent time with them outside of work either. So I don't know. It was, I loved it. I loved it. It was the first time that Johan, Seb, Thompson and me were together in a room since the last day of TI, since the last talk after losing. We've never been in the same room yeah. besides that. So imagine how cool it was that he flew in just to be part of the show and to be part of the finals. Yeah. That was, it was really cool. So the social aspect of TI was great. I got to meet a lot of people on the after party and. It was, it was, I said before in the other podcast that it was not my February after party because it became about work, but the days before leading to the after party was some of the most fun I had in Dora. And I can say right now that I have friends that I didn't have before mm -hmm. with players and people from other communities. And even Faith Beyond came to the show and that was super fun. We got to hang out with him. I don't know. It was, it was awesome. It was an epic week. Yeah. The, the best of it is that. You say like the, the turned into work, but that's what's cool is it's still your friends or it's new friends. So there's guys I knew like as just people who we would play mafia with back at ESL events like 2016. And now these guys are, are like running companies. Um, some really good friends of mine that I've known for five plus years have like won the rights to produce some stuff in Dota. And it's really cool because you still you're still friends, but it's like all of a sudden, like, wait, whoa, we we could work together on some stuff. Like I could like there's like some easy synergies here. I you don't say it like that. That's like the the PC uh, work version of how to phrase it. And it's just wild to me. Like people you knew as kids are suddenly your colleagues, but you still get to be friends. So Kyle, how's guy... for you? Not working mm -hmm. in Dota now. You I mean, have you spoken publicly about what you're doing right now? 
Uh, no, but we can talk about it, I guess, because I'm going to probably post something like tomorrow or over the weekend. Okay. So if we release so, on Tuesday, it's fine. So what, what have you been doing lately in LA? Um, so I guess I moved out here to take a job with WePlay. Um, that's grown into a bit more. Um, I'm the CBO or chief business officer of WePlay Esports. We, due to, you know, the war and just the way that esports functions have kind of refocused on both America and also different kinds of content. Like rather than trying to build out, you know, large scale esport events, we're doing things with like our partners at OTK. Big fans. Um, and then on Tuesdays, funny enough, we're doing a show with the NFL uh, called Tuesday Night Gaming. And then we have a bunch of stuff in the pipeline that I'm really supposed to be working on, which is why I have a hard out. Um, but it's been really interesting kind of leveling up as a, as a person because I have, I'd say, I don't think I've ever like failed miserably at things I've wanted to achieve, but this is definitely a new direction. And there's a lot of seriousness attached that doesn't really exist in the talent world for obvious reasons. Um, but it's really cool. I was the only American for some time. We're still 97% Ukrainian. And I'm really proud of going into work with the guys because they're all incredibly talented. And they, like, the the event we did in Dubai, um, I think you were not there, Jay, but Mira was there. Like, we turned that around right as the war started. And I think we spoke about it a bit on a podcast, but we had 19 people instead of 73. And that was like a four-week lead time, 26 days, actually, to get that going. We had people's wives helping out. We had, like, you know, Maritz, uh, who used to do the TI intros, came in. That was all the silly content that we filmed was just because Maritz was filming it and then editing it on the fly. And he would turn it around, like, 30 minutes. And um, it's just really nice. And it reminds me a lot of, like, my Dota family. They're my Ukrainian family. But there's a lot of crossover between that and Dota. And hopefully, at some point... We'll do another Dota event. I'm actually kind of working on that right now, but it's like 50-50 chance. Now that we spoke about it, I think that I know where I'm going with this conversation and this will probably make it to the podcast. So I'm very happy. So Kyle, you came back to LA. Well, you came to LA and this is when you and I, our friendship continued to develop. You came back mm -hmm. last December. So you've been yep. nearly here for one year yep. and your whole life has been different in LA. Try to put words. Let's go to the, to the personal part of the, of the show. How mm. has your life transformed and your perception of yourself? Hmm, that's that's tough. From a lifestyle perspective, it's been really it was really difficult adjusting because I was on the road and traveling all the time for like the previous five years. And it's very strange to be in the same place and to feel like your life has more not stability, but it's it's got more reality attached. If I'm in Taiwan for a month and then, oh, I'm in London for two weeks, now I'm doing an event or what have you, you know, the connections that you're making, like new friends or you, you date somebody, like there's, there's an expiration on all of it. That life isn't real. Whereas the mm -hmm. friends that I'm making here, the things that I do, it's like, this is my real life. So if I'm not happy with what I'm doing, like I need to make changes because this is what it is. This is where I live. This is what I do. Like what, how can I make myself happy? um within this framework the food's fantastic the weather's really good it is actually really cool to have a real job i'm like excited to email still uh because i've had no sense of like object permanence and normality for effectively 12 years of esports um los angeles is great because there's always people flying in the guest room this is technically the guest room i've had somebody there for like two months now um different friends family members like just kind of a rotating cast of characters and um when i go to my coffee shop everybody knows my name which is nice it could just be because i tip it could be because i'm very warm and friendly or a both. combination of both mm -hmm. but it's nice to have I, there are spots i'm a regular there's a live music spot um harvell's that's really good i know the doorman i know the bartender like i know the band like it's cool and i, I really enjoy being a regular And, and it's nice to have a place that's like truly a physical home. But to be clear, spiritually, I think home is still probably a dote event. So then I think you both, Mira and I, can maybe comment on the transformation that we've seen on you. When, I, oh when you God. came in in January, you were so fucking lost. You were lost in your life. You were lost in your mind. You were mm. having massive identities or figuring out what you were going to do or be. Or like in a way, you couldn't really believe 
how loved and how valued you were to all of us. And mm. I know we talked about this before, but one of the reasons why you end up moving to LA is because I wanted to hire you for OG. And I, I wanted, I, I believed in you and I still believe. And because of that, you end up going to WePlay and went there. And during this year, I've seen how your confidence has gone up. I've seen how you feel more settled and more happy with who you are and where you're in the world. And it's been really cool seeing you, you know, like blossom or glow. So yeah, kudos to you, buddy. Yeah, I mean, I agree. That's what I meant at the start of the podcast when I commented on Kyle's happiness levels going up. Uh, mm. I, I do think that an important part of growing into yourself and into the life that you have or want to build for yourself is stability. And we talked about it on the last, the last podcast, but this lifestyle really does lack stability. Uh, talent life where you're hopping from event to event and you're never really any place for too long. So you can never feel like you place roots or make any new meaningful connections. So I think for somebody like Kyle, it's fun while it's happening, but for the long term, like it does have detrimental effects on your well-being. So I feel like it was more so just kind of a reversal of a lot of that instability and the bad emotions mm. that it brought when he finally kind of settled down. So yeah, I agree with Jay. You're happier and you're more confident and I hope everything just keeps going up, right? That's all you want to see for your friends. And you came to LA, right, Mira? So I you did were come a to LA. Bit of, how was that? <laughs> Do you got to see a little bit of a transformation on our friend here? The uh, subject of these. Yeah. Topic. Yeah. I mean, I no, I didn't really see Kyle in a professional setting, so I can't comment to that. But I mean, as as a friend, like Kyle is my closest friend that I have right now. And um all the oh, time. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry for you. <laughs> no, it, it's great. And we actually did go to that live music spot that he mentioned. Mm, and that awesome. was that was very cool. I mean, when I did come back to LA, Kyle had COVID for six days, so I couldn't see him then. And I ended up Purge was also in LA, so Purge and I ended up doing a museum awesome. tour. Yeah, we ended up doing a museum tour, and that was awesome. I never really properly have been to museums because Jordan isn't really the center of uh, arts and and cultures, you know. <laughs> so that that was a cool experience for me. But when Kyle got better, um, it, I was just glad to after an event like TI, which was very long and very stressful, it was nice to just hang out with your closest friend and just like talk and kind of release all the negative emotions that you had mm. just by complaining to somebody who you know isn't going to like stab you in the back, you know? So <laughs> I did a lot of complaining and he received it very well. So thank you, Kyle. <laughs> how do you saw him? Like uh, how, try to put words into that you saw him more calm or more like how did he transform from the roaming Kyle or the traveling Kyle? I mean, honestly, I don't think I'm the best person to comment on this. Like I, I see a happier Kyle than the Kyle that I worked with a cool. year ago, but I wasn't really, when Kyle was doing most of his talent stuff, I wasn't working as a talent. So I don't really okay. know what the shift in, um, mm. atmosphere was like. No, I think it's really, um, it's the roots. So when you, when I was doing talent, I imagine you're in, you kind of feel the same Mira, like your destiny or your, your life is somewhat out of your control. Like you're going to take, cause you just, you know, like look, DPC is coming up. If you get booked for a DPC in studio A, it means you're spending four months in Poland. If it's studio B, it could be Peru. If it's studio C, it could be from home. So you just don't know. And it's very difficult to make plans or like consider what you want to do with your life. Because, you know, if you're invited to this event, you're gone for two weeks. If you're not, you have two weeks free. Um, Whereas in the my current life, like I have roots down and it's I can kind of control how my time is spent and who I spend it with. So I can invite my friends to come and stay with me or just be in the area and we can go do things. And that's like in my control of it. So it's really just I, I can be a lot more intentional about the way that I live my life and who I spend my time with, um, which is really nice. You lose some of the fun and excitement from the variance like, oh, shit. We're going to Sweden. Awesome. But it's nice. And I would say of all places to live, LA is pretty dope when it comes to being quote unquote stuck here. Like it's 70 degrees and sunny outside right now. I will say that Food the is weather. Fantastic. The weather. Oh my, God. oh my. I just can't believe some people, you two get to experience that weather. 
Yeah. Whenever you feel like so it. We, that's so now I'm going to go around. Kyle, how do you saw Effie when she came to LA? Hmm. <laughs> well, do you, can I, the, so, so she was here twice. The first time, uh, her young, uh, Rudy came out too. And that was funny because her brother. I, yeah. her brother, right? my little brother, yeah, her youngest brother. Yeah, which was funny because I'm I'm the oldest brother of five, and I'd never seen Mira in like an oldest sibling, like mentality. Mm. This is super cute. Rudy is like a great kid, but he's like he's 19. He's a kid. Um, so we were just like out and about, showing him the sights and stuff. Uh, I think Mira, it, it, the biggest change I think is just kind of grown into herself a lot more. Um, <clears throat> I. And this is something I'm working on. I, I have a bad habit, and Mira rides me about this often, that I, I she says I'm a poor judge of character. I don't know if... Really? I, so, Extremely hang on. Right. What, what, what it is, in which way, in what which it way. is, this is my problem. I've, I've really my problem. My problem is that when I look at people, I see people for who they could be, not for who they are. And that can be, I think, endearing, but it's also like not necessarily good for me, because I will ignore different bad qualities <clears throat> of like people I've been in relationships with or people that I've befriended because it's like, it's just like, Oh, like this is something it's like not a big deal. Like it's just a, it's part of accepting a person as a whole is like the love bad and positive characteristics. But the problem is that I tend to see like the rosy rose colored glasses version of people and thus will allow them into a much more like intimate circle of trust than perhaps they have earned. So, but based on that, like, I always knew Mira was a badass and awesome, which is why I always told her you should do talent work. I think I also had the caveat, like, I can do it. It's so easy. Just give it a shot. Like, come on. This is you just talk about Dota. And I knew she was a degenerate. And the transformation from Mira at the Animator, where I think that there was a lot more. Uh, Man, this is like really personal. It's weird this is going public, but the same way you said, Jay, that you didn't know if you felt like you belonged until like this TI. I don't know if Mira felt like she belonged when she was first at the Annie Major, which was sad to me because she's literally been a Dota fan and player since longer than I was. We're telling the story about the Boston Major, Mira. This is the time. This, this, she. Not much of a story. She, she flew. She wanted to go to the Boston Major so bad that she flew and she slept on the floor of like a one bedroom apartment with, with three other people just because she was she wanted to see the Boston Major and like go to her first land. I would never have done that ever in my life. Anyway, main point. Mira, Mira belongs. I think she's Thank accepted you. like she belongs and that she's a part of the scene there are people who love Mira in Dota and that she's like a part a of, of, of this thing that is Dota. Um, but she, it's annoying too, cause she's sort of speed running the Dota talent career. And she's where I was in like year three and a half. At it's called year talent, one. Kyle. It's called talent. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that. I mean, that. <laughs> and the, like mentality shift. I, it's, uh, okay, come on. I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, I, it's actually true that I didn't really feel like I belonged in the sense that people were reacting to me in a way that felt, um, like untrue of what the reality was right so a lot of the things that i would read online is like who is this person has she even played dota i've played dota since i, I was 14 i'm 27 right? i've played dota since dota one i i literally all of my life half of my life at this point i've been playing dota so to hear people say that i don't even play the game i was hired and thought it was just so strange to me it was like but i've streamed for seven years i've been playing since dota one why is it so hard to believe that i'm just a dota fan but I think that it was just because of how quickly I came into the scene and how my stream wasn't that well known. I had like 200 viewers, 300 viewers back when I was streaming regularly uh, before the Animator. So I kind of like learned to just accept that, yeah, objectively, it can look a little bit odd. And then when I learned to accept that and not care as much, I found that like the community itself grew more accepting with time and it helped me do my job a lot more comfortably and a lot easier. So, I mean, I'm glad you guys think I grew into my myself. I hope I can keep growing into myself. It's a, it's a process, right? I think that for me, it's a little bit hard to see a lot of your transformation because it also depends on your relationship with me. Mm -hmm. So I don't get to see you at work. But I remember the first time that I met you was much more coy, much more shy in a way 
there was a lot of little, let's say, ticks or little things that show me that you didn't feel fully comfortable with talking to me or being on the podcast and all that. But as our relationship has developed, it also means that all of those things go away. And every single time I see you, now you're confident, the way you see it, the way you talk, you're completely unapologetic at this point. Before you used yeah. to say things like, am I saying something that is right? But always open to corrections where now they're, you're very assertive. This is mm -hmm. just how it is. This yeah. is, this, this is it is. So it's been really, really cool. And in a way, the one criticism that maybe I had from you from the beginning was that I needed to see the assertive mirror. Because in a way, some of your, let's say, attributes, how, how sweet you are, how girly you are, completely can be undermined if you're not assertive. Mm -hmm. But now that you feel very assertive with where you are and the talent work that you do and the things that you're doing outside, then I think that people immediately respond in a completely different way. They are not guessing if you know what you're talking about. And that comes actually from your attitude more than who you are or who you were. Yeah. Because if you, Absolutely. if you're assertive, people will follow. I, I agree completely. Um, for me, it's a process that's going to continue to happen because the key factor in all of this is, uh, me just becoming apathetic towards people's opinions of me, right? Because once you let go of the way people perceive you or look at you or whatever they think about you, then you can just say whatever you want to say and be who you want to be. Because I don't think I've changed many parts of myself, but I've just kind of learned to try to care less. And I think that that's going to be like a whole gradual transformation over a few years. But I'm at a point right now where like I genuinely just don't care. If I read something online now, I just roll my eyes at it, right? So it, it took about a year and a half to get here, but I hope that it just doesn't become a problem anymore. Because once you stop caring about, you know, what Boner Boy 69 on Reddit has to say about <laughs> about what you did that day or, or how well you do your job, then you can just do your job without giving a shit. And I think not giving a shit is probably the best quality you can have as a talent, which is actually why Kyle was so good at his job. Even though he's incredibly polarizing, he just didn't give a shit, right? And that's why so many people were just kind of drawn to watch somebody who had charisma and was often saying things that were completely wrong, but saying it in a way that was like so convincing, right? It, it doesn't matter what you say at that point. Well, it's how you say it. <laughs> I think that's, for, for me, that's Kyle, why I was I nominated to... <laughs> for an award. <laughs> but Kyle, for me, was, for me, was, for me was, the problem that I had with you is like, you know, there are potholes in the middle. Do you really have to step in every single one of them? <laughs> Can you keep your feet dry for at least 20 minutes? Because this, this is the normal uh, organic process of Kyle. Hey, dude, there is a pothole there. I'm going to step on it. Kyle, I don't think you should. I totally see it. Oh, shit, my feet are wet. Oh, shit, my feet are wet. Well, you, you knew that it was going to happen. And then for the next day, we're only talking about how his feet are wet. I'm like, there's another one there and you're running to it. Like, dude, avoid some of them, you know? Can we have a normal life? We don't have to constantly be doing, you know, damage control about your career. I understand. But look, it's a learning experience. The, the the position I'm in now is because I was always trying to solve problems that weren't mine until I finally had the responsibility for them. And in this case, it was my friends. If it wasn't my friends, it'd be a different story. But if it's people that I love who are going to be hurt, then I can't not say anything. And that's my just father, like... My father had a saying that you just fell in the hole and you're trying to justify how you didn't fail, but you wanted to purposefully to be there. I mean, you can, in a way, post-rationalize things to be one way. But as mm -hmm. I mentioned to you, you wouldn't have to go through a lot of pains if you were sure. sometimes, you know, to step on every one of those potholes. But at the end of the day, you are who you are, and we love you for this funny, clowny personality you have. I would say, just the only caveat, is that I really do care a lot about what specific people think of me. And if somebody that I love has an issue or feels like I've wronged them, it eats at me for weeks. Like it, it really sucks. Like I am still upset that I made this snide comment about Mira not being able to drive because it invalidated something I said to her in Jordan and it hurt and it annoys the hell out of me. But when it comes to like internet feedback or commentary, I mean, it's not real. So Mira, uh, do you consider moving to LA? Is that something that you think that will make you happy? It would make me happy because I would be around people that I really like. Because there's a lot of people in LA, uh, Kyle included, his cousin Josh. 
um, other friends that I have there. Just it's his birthday today, Joss. Happy birthday. Oh, happy birthday, Josh. Um, 25. Yeah, so a lot of people just are based in LA because of the nature of the city kind of being a hub for all things entertainment. So a lot of my friends from streaming and esports, they live there. So the idea of me living there just so I could be around people that I really care about is really cool. Uh, in terms of logistical aspects like real estate costs and living costs and food costs, like all of that is ridiculous, right? But now that I've been okay. to LA, I, I will say that uh, the weather definitely makes up for a lot of those financial costs. Like I can, because I, I am the type of person who feels um, either energetic or lethargic for the day, depending on how much sun I get. But it's just how I am. And I mean, a place like LA, from what I've seen, has been entirely sunshine. So that sounds really cool. It gets more, I believe it has the most sunshine of any city or major city in the Northern Hemisphere. It's like actually insane. You get twice as much, so more than twice as much sun as London. I would say there's a reason why studios in Hollywood made it here. The way that the topography works, we're surrounded by mountains and we are close to a desert. So the, the cloud formation really makes it very dry and clouds, it's hard for them to, to build up here. Which is why we have more day, sunny days than any of them, any other world in in America at least, and that was very good for studios. But now I will challenge you guys because I am completely out of love from LA. I'm I'm, I'm heartbroken. I have no love for this place. Mm -hmm. I spent the last three months of my life away, and I, I didn't want to be back. I actually am moving away from LA for a little bit. I need a break from this place, and. It's, it's more like a life thing, but I'll try to explain it in, in a way. I was today in a car and the person next to me was literally swerving around like this on the road. And I go next to, to him and I'm like, hey, leave your phone, dude. You're doing this. Immediate response was like, well, fuck you. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, <laughs> in, in what place in the world I will point out something that he's doing wrong. And instead of saying, I'm so sorry, I needed to do this. I'm sorry. Yeah. His immediate reaction is just anger. And... I felt that I've been in Buddhist places for the last three months. I've been in Southeast Asia and all that. Everybody has been love. Everybody has been calmness and, and peaceful. And I got here a week ago and it's been this level of aggression, desperation, and people just maybe not like they're all in there in a rat race in LA because everything is extremely expensive and you have to make more money and you have to be more successful. And you constantly have this in your mind and, I don't know. People don't know how to be happy in LA. So I love LA. I've been here for 14 and a half years. And right now I need a break from it. Yeah. That's a pretty stark contrast from our last podcast because you were like singing LA's praises and talking about how much you enjoy it. So uh, I, I think that things like that are always a matter of perspective, right? Like all it takes is for you to go somewhere more peaceful where people have more even temperaments and suddenly the way that you look at something changes entirely. Right. Yeah. That, that's why it's so hard to make a decision of where you want to live in the world. I would say that it's very tricky and I don't feel fully comfortable sharing everything right now on the podcast, but I will say that LA is an amazing place to get X, Y, and Z, but there is clear deficiencies of things that you get in LA. For example, it's very hard to find meaningful relationships with people because everybody is very worried or very focused on their own mm. personal growth or career growth. So for example, I'm somewhere else in the world and I always have somebody to have dinner with or somebody to hang out with. In LA, even with close friends, I have to schedule it four days in advance sometimes. Because otherwise we will not find time because everybody's busy. We, we don't Kyle, not specifically you, I'm making about you, but it's like <laughs> you're busy with event y, X, Y, and C, mm. but I also wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning, so I have to go to bed at nine. So oh. it's very hard to find people to do things with you because there is not a lot of people that have nine to fives in LA. So it's just a complication. And also I came right now to LA to take care of my cats that live with my ex. She lives, I think it's five miles away from my house. It takes me an hour and a half to go there. Honestly, it feels like a different place Jeez. and a different city. I like a lot of the things of LA. I feel that I'm in the moment of my life right now that I'm looking for a little bit more of more meaningful relationship with people. I maybe significant others or a possibility of significant others. 
or maybe it's just more friendships that are less utilitary or less mm. based on what we can do for each other, which everything like that feels like that in LA. And again, I think I, was, I should do a podcast one day just about dating stories because that will really reflect in a way a lot of these things that I'm, that I'm saying. Mm. But it's rare when you meet someone in LA and they're not figuring out what you can do for them in the short term or long term. I, I heard it's, it's there. Yeah, I, I heard that from a lot of people actually, that it's really hard to like meet the love of your life if you're in a city like LA. Just because I would say even non platonica, yeah. even non platonic, just a friend. It's very hard for a friend to make time for you if they're not thinking in some point mm -hmm. where is this investment leading me to what? And I told Kyle from the beginning, I don't want in a way your friendship and mine to be about work. Zero. I, zero. So, but there's many people, people that Kyle actually know well, or that I had experience with them where it's like, okay, well, I have four hours a week that I can dispose into advance my career one way or another one, or even just personally. And they will choose how to deploy it, those hours, you know, to try to get something out of them. And for me, I when I was in Thailand and when I was in Singapore and when I was like that, I never felt that level of anything. Nobody wanted anything from me besides my company. And I liked that. It became very relaxing. So mm. Kyle said something very interesting as well. It's not reality when you're traveling around. Yeah. And suddenly you come back to LA and all these things that I have to do suddenly just hit me in the face. I'm like, okay, maybe I'm ready just to go again and just live in my mm. bubble for a little bit more. So I just have to run. But I wanted to clarify, um, I'm at a point, there, there's a good line, like, you'll be lucky to make five good friends in your life. And I think that we, because we're extroverted and because we come from like really social like careers and backgrounds, we feel like we're way more alone than we are because I feel that I have more than five good friends. I think that, you know, you both are very close to me and very good friends of mine and I should feel blessed if you were the only two important people in my life, you know, let alone my enormous family. Um, and I think that we, you know, the, the, the secret sauce for happiness is gratitude and it's appreciating what you do have. And the other caveat, you know, every place is perfect if you're leaving soon. Um, and there is such a thing as the curse of the traveler. And it's why, you know, the more places you see, like the more people you date, the harder it's going to be to find your, your forever home and your soulmate, because you can't find this person that has bits and pieces of everything that you love the same way you'll never find like the weather and food of LA mixed with the peace of Taiwan and the nightlife of Amsterdam and the, you know, the nature available in Colorado. So you just have to find what works best and then import which is why you should stay in Los Angeles, Jay. Mira, you should move to Los Angeles. We're going to get a big ass house. So it's more cost effective on a per person basis. It's going to have a pool, a sauna, a hot tub. Chef Come Josh on. is going to be grilling it up outside. It's going to be fantastic. Kyle, I'm 37 and can't be living with a bunch of 20s. You can have the guest house, man. Hey, it's Kyle's fine. 30 no. now, Jay. It's 20. It's true. It's 20, 29 plus one. That's what he is, you know? Mm. Well, Kyle, I love you if both. You have to go. I, yeah, I have to go. I'm sorry, but Do you I mind will, if we stay um, a little bit longer talking shit about you when you leave. Sure, don't worry well, about we'll it. We'll do the two man show. The way it should have always the two been. man show. The Juan and Juan. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> Goodbye, friends. Kyle, thank you so much for being here. No worries. Mwah. See you guys. Cheers, Cheers. Ivan. Good luck. I think for me to to echo what you were saying. I think for me it was not really only been about the, the romantic version of, of this finding someone that cares about me. I think it's also been very platonic. I would say that I've experienced something very interesting lately. Uh, <laughs> how do I say this? By the way, I'm, when I was by, making, by the way yep. I'm, I'm not yawning because I'm not interested. I'm just extremely jet lagged. So I, I just have to oh, preface no worries, that. No worries. Because I thought I'm, you were sneezing. No, I've been yawning so. a lot throughout the show, but yeah, go on. No worries. So I would say that when I was making movies, making movies in LA makes you very cool, very interesting and very sexy in a way. So a lot of people will come to you because you can do things for them, which is real. You know, you can do things for them. And it's always very hard to know who cares about you and who cares about what you can do for them or how you can 
better their careers. And in the past, uh, through my significant others or the relationships that I've chosen, I have done a lot for them. Mm -hmm. And I have, in a way, accelerated their careers. But I was happy, you know, they are my significant others. So why wouldn't I be happy, you know, my girlfriends at the time? But at one point, I, I realized that maybe I, I don't want necessarily just to be used, you know, for everything. And then by the time I stopped making movies, I thought like, well, being a nerd and being Dota doesn't really get anybody excited about me. And it's true in LA, no one cares about me being the CEO of a Dota team. Honestly, I, it's harder. I could just say that I work in a Starbucks and it would be easier <laughs> for people to understand what I do. But I felt it at TI. Yeah. I felt it for the first time. For the first time, and it was a very strange concept. But it came from a very interesting place of love instead of a place of usage, like in LA. Because the little nerds in which I'm one of them of this community, it's not that they're trying to use me. They're just literally excited to be around us or associated with us and just want to be part of this. Like, you know, I get emails all the time. How can I be part of OG? How can I be part of OG? But in LA, it's more Machiavellic. It's more evil. Yeah. They're hiding their, you know, the real intentions behind different layers. And I, I can do a little bit more with, of the nerds. I like the nerds. The LA is too dark right now. Uh, I understand. <laughs> I mean, the things that you're, you're describing, um, I haven't really dealt with it in terms of like setting, but I have dealt with it just by virtue. Or, I don't think, but by nature of being a girl, right? So usually for, for most girls, there's a little bit of a universal experience in that when you talk to people, like you don't know whether or not they're trying to sleep with you. Right? That, that is something that always happens. So you learn to be very wary of people, uh, which is just going back to the previous conversation when Kyle mentioned that I thought he was a bad judge of character. <laughs> I, I genuinely do think so, but I think it's because his experiences were so different than mine. When he would, he'll like praise somebody who I know is not a great person. And I'll just... We have had that experience, yeah. Kyle and I, <laughs> several times. I'll, I'll, I'll be... Initially, I'm just very confused because it's kind of like how how are you not seeing what is so obvious but i realize it's because his life and his experiences are are his and they're very un unique to him but he also just wasn't put in a lot of situations where people are just talking to him for certain reasons right i mean obviously that does happen now that he is working with we play and all of that but i i feel like a city like la also in that sense, if you're an LA native or if you've been there for a long time, it should teach you the same things of kind of how to judge whether or not people are actually interested in knowing you or they're just interested in what the, you can give them. But it broke me in. It broke me because I can see it so fast right now. I can understand greed. I've seen it. I've seen it. So in a way, I might miss some of good people just because they come in a package mm -hmm. that I indirectly just put aside. So it has made me very, very jaded. I mean, because of that, I can understand why you want to leave because there are certain ages that you reach where you feel like you've like lived what you want to live and you're at a point where socializing becomes something that you want to seek comfort in rather than newness or intrigue or excitement because a lot of the excitement comes with potential uh, bad people like yeah. we mentioned before. So you wanting to move somewhere more peaceful <laughs> with people who don't get angry or who aren't always competing with each other or trying to one-up each other, using each other. I, I can understand that because like I was in LA for a vacation and it was nice for a vacation. And I could see myself living there while I'm still establishing my career and working towards certain goals. But if I ever wanted to settle down and have a family, I most certainly would not live somewhere it's like impossible that. impossible in LA. But I think that LA will accelerate so fast your career. I think that you have a full package. I mean, if you want, if money was an ambition of yours, you can make more money here than you can make anywhere else. If success, what in the streamer world, content creator world, the journalistic world, this could accelerate the shit out of your career, but you will pay a price Yeah. to do it, you know? Hmm. Um, I think that I'm, I'm lucky enough to not kind of go to a city like that uh, dark because I have 
already a network of friends there and people mm-hmm. that I'm close to. So most people don't really have something like that when they're like moving for the sake of the pursuit of their dreams. But obviously this is all uh, speculative and hypothetical so far because I'm not even sure if I can, you know, go there, let alone want to. I, I would love you to be in LA and I would love you and Kyle at the same time to be in LA with me because you will see a different LA. LA in a way is like, it's a, it's a very complicated, a very complicated city. Let me just try to explain to the viewers uh, why I think it's a lot of complicated because there is a, a movie industry and there is people that are in a way, big fish in their own small communities that they think, well, one day I'm going to go to LA and I'm going to become a superstar. And you, there is hundreds of thousands of people that come to the city to become actors and actresses and directors and all that. Very, very, very few will make it. So there is an immense level of rejection that they will have to deal with every day. When you go to auditions, you go to a room where you're going to go to hundreds of auditions before you get a single role. And the worst part is you go to those rooms and everybody looks like you. They're looking for a dark hair, dark eyes, a Spanish looking guy with a beard. So you're constantly being focused on or being shown people that look like you. So I will say objectives, dreams are connected. Your work and your passion is all connected. And then you come to the city. And it's just a, a city where either you make it or you don't make it. That's level one. Level two is that the, the city, like many others, uh, is separated or segregated by how much money you make. And your money that you have will literally make you live in one layer of life or it will make you live in a different layer of life. Mm-hmm. Try to explain it. All the way in the top, we have celebrities and millionaires. They go to a specific gyms. They go to a specific places. And those gyms, those cities, those buildings that they, that they live in, they are on purpose overpriced. So nobody else gets to go there. So a normal gym, for example, is 30 bucks. They will go to a gym that is $400 a month on purpose. So nobody else can afford it. I mean, that's miserable. I went for lunch yesterday with my friend for a meeting and the lunch cost me $120. We didn't need anything special. But this is the area that I live in Marina. It's designed for people not to be able to afford it. So we don't have to be in a restaurant where somebody can afford a $20 salad. So they make it overpriced again. So you don't even get to see those people there. You see, it's like so strange. It's like layers. That's, I mean, I have a similar experience. Just I bought two breakfast sandwiches and two coffees in L.A., for me and Purge, and I paid $50. And I thought that was so ridiculous because in Jordan, two coffees and two sandwiches, you pay 10 JDs at most, which is like $14. And that's like, Amman isn't really a cheap city either. So for me to go somewhere where everything is just so insanely overpriced, like how do you even justify charging like $20 for a sandwich? I don't, this kind of thing is crazy to me. And then when I, when I hear you describe the city in such a way, it kind of, demotivates me from ever wanting to go there honestly because i mean for for the last few months a lot of people in that place have just been trying to convince me to move out there and telling me that it would be great for my career and i would just be happier and things like that but if the entire nature of the city is so vain and superficial and it's just a constant competition that really does take away from my desire to like ever i think that you have to experience my advice would be you know, don't burn all your bridges behind you, mm-hmm. but come to LA and experience it in a temporary way. Because there's a lot of really cool things. I mean, the good thing about LA, everybody's super motivated. Everybody wants to hustle. Everybody wants to do those things. The bad part is that because of the hustle and the layers and all that, you kind of constantly be in this rat race. I have this, maybe this strange story. When I went to Thailand, the, the average peer person in Bangkok, I think they make like under $400. Yeah. But I make over $400. So let's say that I... Hypothetically, for our viewers or to, to understand it, let's say that I make $3,000 a month. Okay, so I am so ahead of the average income from everybody else that every single thing that I get to do gets to be very fun for me at a very reasonable price. But in a way, everybody, everything that I get to do, the local population cannot do it because it's so far away from what they're experiencing. So for me, I can go, oh my God, I want to eat sushi and I only paid 30 bucks. This is amazing. But 30 bucks for them is an immense amount of money. So I am in a completely different layer. But let's say that the layer in Bangkok is 
is a very affordable layer. And then you hit top and now you're there. Yeah. In LA, with an income of five, six thousand dollars a month, you struggle. You struggle, huh? It's, it's rough for five, six thousand dollars. It's, it's, it's rough. That's it. Because in most places in the world, you can live very well with five, six thousand dollars. Very well. Very, extremely well. You know, you will not be lacking for anything and you'll, you'll be able to have savings. But in LA, I feel like if you have five thousand dollars a month, that's almost paycheck to paycheck for a lot of parts of LA, right? Depends of again of the things that you get to opt in and you want to opt out. If you want to get a car, cars insurance are very expensive. Car, mm-hmm. like for example, I spend in one week uh, fuel in my car the same amount of money that I spend in two and a half months on Ubers in Southeast Asia. In one week, I don't have to have a car. I can opt in in the public transportation, but my commute goes from 30 minutes to an hour and a half. And it becomes this very weird game because, okay, if I show up to a date with a very shitty car, people are going to think that I'm like this. But it shouldn't matter, you know, because they're, they're, the person that they're going to try to meet is who you are, truly. But in LA, that everybody is already part of this rat race, you have to look one way, you have to have specific clothes, you have to have this specific haircut, you have to behave in a specific way in order for people to understand or see just feel at ease with what they're dating. I mean, I'm 37 and I'm a CEO of a company. If I show up with my fuck you flip-flops, you know, they're going to be like, okay, this is this guy. If I show up in a Ferrari, they're going to think, okay, this is this guy, you know? They, and at the end of the day, everybody's trying to make sense about the, the world that they perceive to, in order to navigate it. I feel that every single time I go on a date in LA, they have incredibly unreasonable expectations. And it would be very comical if I were to tell some of my stories because I've gone on dates where the girl drove a Ferrari to the date. I mean, I, okay, I'll tell you this last joke. I don't remember the last time a girl reached out for her wallet to pay for dinner in LA. I'm not going to let her pay. I will pay. But can we at least play this fantasy where you pretend that you want to pay? And I say, no, no, don't worry. I got this. So I don't even get to feel like a superhero. I don't get to feel like, no, no, don't worry, girl. I got this dinner. Because it's already assumed that I'm going to pay. Is that common in America? Because this is actually an interesting conversation. And I remember someone brought it up on Twitter a few months ago. But I think like every culture has its own dating expectations. So actually in Arab culture, um, typically women don't pay, but it's not because they're women. Uh, I mean, back in the day, I guess it was, but it's usually just like the inviting party, the party who invites the other person out. Like there's a societal or social expectation where they, they pay. And, but your job as the receiving end of that, as an Arab, is that when it comes time for the bill to be paid, you fight, you know, tooth and nail. You're like, no, I- You pretend, good. <laughs> you go, no, I of got course. this. And they say, no, 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 I swear on my mother's life, you know? And it's like a whole, it's like a whole battle for 10 minutes. It's a whole game, okay. Yeah, but you like, but there, there is kind of like an implied knowledge that the inviting party always does. Like you, you kind of like learn this from your parents, right? Like if your dad invites your family out for a dinner, you watch him and your, un- your uncles just fight over it. But in the end, my dad would pay because he's the one who organized the dinner. And if my uncles <laughs> organized the dinner, they would end up paying and, and things like that. So it's actually pretty common for girls to pay here if they're the ones who organize the outing. Like for me personally, I right now I'm in a position where uh, even if I take my friends out to lunch or something and I insisted on going somewhere, I'll end up paying for them, even if it's not really expected for friendship outings and things like that, just because... I'm happy to do so knowing that I'm in a good place financially right now. So that makes me feel good. But every time I do it, they also fight me for it. You know, <laughs> my friend and I, May, we had noodles a few days ago and she was like, let me do it, please. I beg you. <laughs> she was so sincere about it. And I was like, no, it's okay. Cause I, I just like, you know, spending money on her. It, it just feels nice. So I, I guess I'm, I'm not old enough to be jaded yet when it comes to this. <laughs> So, I mean, for me to wrap the podcast, it would say it was just really a shame not having you at TI. I feel very far away from you and some of the other talent. And I wish you were there and joined with all of us because we created a big sense of community and closeness that unfortunately we don't even have with you. We didn't have the chance to share it with you. Yeah. Um, to be completely honest, it did make me very sad 
to not be in Singapore and not be able to experience that. Because like I mentioned, I have been working for about a year and a half now, but I haven't really gotten to experience the um, LAN aspect of broadcast work or just hanging out with fans, hanging out with my friends, other players, like feeling like I'm part of the community. Um, I did get to feel that in Malaysia and it was really cool, but I think feeling it at TI is an entirely different thing. And as an analyst or caster or broadcaster, whatever it is that you do, you work with one goal in mind, which is TI at the end of the year. And a big part of it is just being able to feel like part of the community and just part of the celebration. So um, I think that I wasn't the only person who was unhappy. Uh, for the most part, a lot of people were sad and they did get over it. And I think that like everyone in Norway did a great job, uh, all things considered. And while I can see the the positives to remote broadcasting, I think that a happy compromise would be a remote studio in the same like location as TA, right? Not not necessarily like within the vicinity of the arena, but at least in the same city, so that on your days off you could, or like on the shifts that you're not working, you could go to the arena and watch, right? Because I I do feel like being in good spirits is an important part of putting on a good show. So maybe that part was a bit of an oversight. And this is just like me, honestly, saying how I feel about it. <clears throat> but I mean, like I said, all things considered, I think we put on a really good show. I think we were all in it together. And it, it was it was definitely something that taught me a lot about uh, the industry, right? Like, like I mentioned, we didn't really talk about the studio that we worked for. Uh, they were called Marie's, they're a Norwegian studio. And they work with augmented reality. And it was my first time. Oh, yeah. Nice. So it was like a proper AR studio. We had, it, it was the highest tech AR studio in the world, actually, as far as I was told. And seeing the whole process being put together and like seeing it come to life and just seeing how many people are dedicated to their craft was a very invaluable thing for me uh, okay. as somebody who's like learning about this industry. So uh, experience wise and concept wise, very cool. I, I do think that some happy mediums can be met in the future. I hope they will be, but I'm not really in the know when it comes to Dota, so I, I don't I don't okay. really get news or information about what happens. You mentioned something very very good because I actually mentioned this as well in one of the other shows. Um, there is these little moments that you share with us or with anybody that is in the players' hotel because you eat together and you mix tables. We're not all in our same bubbles. I had lunch with one day with somebody else. Somebody, you will just sit, really sit with whoever was there. You were not part of any of that. The pool, the elevators rise, the lunch, the rides to the arena. That's in a way when you meet those little moments, you know, of friends. Because you get to ride with Chris Lack, you know, or you get to ride with somebody else that is going to the arena with Saber Light in the bus mm -hmm. we were with him. So, yeah, yeah that's weird. But not just that. And the one thing that you missed. Got, sorry, no, go no, ahead. I was going to say no, the last joke that I was going <laughs> to make is that every single time we went out partying, Boba was wearing the EG jersey every day in every club. <laughs> so you got to miss, you get to miss, you miss that as well. You know? I mean, Which is, uh, I'm happy to miss that. <laughs> Just kidding. You're, you're it's great. funny how you're he wears it. I, I wear the hat and I yeah. guess nobody mentioned this. It's uh, the question mark heart uh, from the EG game. As RTZ still does not have the buyback gold. Big ship in from Arba gets the ball, they can't consider them. RTZ moving in, they've got the link down on a fly, 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 fly. Can they fly for the line still? Can they take him out in time? They can! The Rift gets fly, fly out of there! It's RTZ, he's low. Emo's back in, RTZ gonna drop. dead. Emo's able to just walk back up to him and now with the Hex, Emo's able to set him on to crit. The Hex into the stun. A question mark Question mark, mark in the old chat. All oh right, I goodness. love that. GG, GG is called. Oh, he was just standing go. there. All right. There we go, ladies and gentlemen, spicing it up a little bit. But yeah, yeah. so hmm, it's a good hat. Huh? <laughs> we haven't sold it yet, but I, I love it. <laughs> I it. wear it sometimes <laughs> just for trolling. But yeah, sorry, besides the joke, you know, you get to miss all these mm -hmm. little things about the, the event. Yeah, I mean, outside of the social aspect, which... You can honestly make a strong argument that it's not Valve's problem. And it's true. It's not their problem. Like they hire people to work the show and the whether or not they're having a good time at the show is not part of the job, right? Whether or not they can hang out with their friends in their free time, it's it's not their responsibility. So I understand that, but I do think there's like an interesting aspect to analysis at events that comes from interacting with the players directly. Like it's just little tidbits of information you hear uh, here and there. The, the, uh, 
vibes that you get from the players, right? Like a lot of times, like during last TI, before we would go uh, on broadcast, we'd go get breakfast and we'd see some teams at breakfast and some of them looked happy and the others looked like depre- looked angry or sad or frustrated. And just having that kind of information to go and say, hmm, they didn't look like they were in high spirits today as part of the panel discussion, I think is really interesting for people back home because it gives them a little bit of a peek into the behind the scenes um, yeah. part of esports and competition that they wouldn't necessarily get, right? Because how else are they going to know that EG looked angry the morning before their loss, you know? But when when the panel so. is there on location, they can share little tidbits like that. So you also lose out on that uh, in terms of broadcast quality. So yeah, another story outside of the broadcast quality is that a lot of people did join trips after the, I don't know if you saw it. <laughs> yeah. So the gaming gladiators went to Thailand, to Phuket, and then Aoi and Anna and Snakein, they went to, I think it's Korea with Anna, and then they went to Tokyo, Creed and Nad, and I think Brial were at Tokyo. Yeah. Like all these little trips uh, kind of spawn from all of us being on that side of the world. And it's very funny, like completely different teams, completely different players, completely different things. And they're all hanging out together and going on trips. Yeah, it's just random, right? So, you're, you're just like, hey, do you want to go to Japan? And some person's just like, yeah, I'll go to Japan. <laughs> and you just end up there. It's really cool. Because they literally opened Japan when we were there. Because Japan has been closed for mm-hmm. a few years. And they opened it up while we were there. So everybody was like, okay, let's go. I'm going to go in December. So yeah, it was, I don't know. It was, it was so cool. And the fans were so cool. And I got to speak in a university as well. And I got to do a few other, let's say, more social or political events. I met with the minister of uh, culture there. And yeah, I got to, you know, kiss babies and wave <laughs> hands and shake hands and take photos. It became very, very public for me as well. Mm-hmm. But that, that sounds like an overall positive experience. Um, I, I think it was great. I think it's really important when you're working in esports to also have that uh, those times or those moments where you can feel appreciated and you can feel loved and you can feel like part of something that really wants you to be there because uh, often that is lost in everything being online. Being part of OG is better than being part of the other teams because we get more love than everybody else, but we also get to do more things than everybody else. Mm-hmm. So it's extra special, extra good for us. And I do need to talk about this before we move and we say goodbye because there is a lot of conversations about orcs leaving Dota. So T1 left Dota and obviously EG closed the roster in North America. I don't want to be the one saying where they're going or what they're doing. It's up to them. But I want to publicly say that for anybody that thinks that Dota is not a good business or Dota is not a good place, they're wrong. And in a way, the more of you guys living, the more of Dota I will own and I will <laughs> do, and I'm going to do more shows and I'm going to do more stores and I'm going to do more monkey business shows. I will pick up the slack that anybody else that drops the ball because this community continues to be freaking awesome. Mm. And we had a hundred thousand views on the monkey business show live. And then we had 180,000 views on the Faith Beyond episode. There is a massive appetite for this content and for these things. And hey, if it's me at the end of the day, you know, me and the cockroaches left, I will be there. But the love that I have for this community and for this game is is the core of who OG became. And in five, six years, if we're in six, seven games, we're still going to feel the same way about Dora. It's the game that I play. It's the game, literally the only game that I play. I'm happy to hear that. Um, I heard some rumors about some orgs potentially losing interest, ones that are still currently active. And obviously it scares me as a Dota fan, but I feel like at some point the gloom and doom thinking that the community has had recently does need to end because if everybody thinks that way, it just kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? But if the community is still passionate about the game, if they're still loving, if there are still some orgs that are dedicated to the game, then it's only going to be uphill from there, right? Because uh, all that positivity is just going to attract more positivity and push it up. So I think that I, I, I did fall victim to a little bit of that negative thinking of, oh my God, is this the end? Is, 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 
Dota coming to an end? Are, are people getting bored? What's going to happen? But I snapped out of that really quickly after I saw how happy and passionate people were after TI and the stories that I heard and some of the things that I read online. So all I can say is I'm, I'm glad that there are orgs like OG that are still so in love and so willing to help Dota grow. And I, I just really hope that, you know, the things people are saying aren't true because I, I wouldn't know what to do with myself, Jay. If, if there wasn't Dota, like I actually, I, I don't know what my life would look like or be like. Dota is not going anywhere. What it go, what might go away is the current version of how we see the ecosystem. But I don't think it's, what well, to be pragmatic, it's not what it is or what it's not. It's just, that's just how it is. You know, like there is nothing that I can do besides trying to, in a way, either inspire to the change that I want or be the change that I want. OG next year will be doing the monkey business show live in every one of the majors. That is going to happen. And I will be building a merch store in every one of the majors. Part of my business plan for 2023 is that we will have more than one show. Monkey business show is one. I want to do, if possible, three more shows. As long as the community is supported, I will continue to create things for them. And if the community stops supporting, then my question would be, what am I doing wrong that there is no product market fit? I'm not blaming on the community. Like, you know, if the community is not supporting something that I'm doing, it's because I'm doing something that the community doesn't want. So is my ego on the way or what is it happening? But if you look at YouTube, there is an incredible amount of content consumed by Dota, Dota fans. And if you look at Twitch, yes, streamers on Twitch are not massive in Dota, but every single time we go online to play, there is massive viewership. So we're good. We're good. I honestly feel very, very optimistic about this. And as a joke, the more orgs that live, the more of the TI winnings that I will, I will get. <laughs> so at the end, if it's just me and look, you know, yeah, fuck it. All, all, all of them will be mine. I mean, you sound like an evil mastermind when you phrase it like that, but I know that it's, it's a positive thing that you're saying. I want money to go into other orgs that love Dota. Tandra is doing cool shit. There's all the people that are doing cool things. Mm -hmm. And I want the money to be given to the players. I want their lives to change. Like Johan said, Topia's life change. And these guys went in and then build their own teams and they build their own companies and they build their own these, which is in a way employing me, which is why I can employ other people, you know? So it's a circle of life, you know? Without the money from TI, we couldn't be doing what we're doing right now. Without these, I could not enable other people to make more money. So part of my job is to make as much money as possible for my new, the new kids, you know, the new roster. And hopefully these guys will continue including their brands and continue doing content like Taiga is doing, like BCM is doing. They have their own social media people. So all of these creates this circle of positivity mm. that we can create, you know? So no, let's be honest. Yes, $40 million sounds like a lot of money. It is a lot of money, but so is 18. So is 18. Okay. So yes, obviously I want 40, but so is 18. Mm -hmm. 18 is also very transformative. So we're in a good place. I'm, I'm glad you put it like that. Um, all I can say is that I hope that things develop for the best because I do believe in if there's anything that I believe in when it comes to Dota, it is the community's love for the game. Um, it's just always been there from mm -hmm. the conception to the very end. A lot of people feel the same way that I do about the game, which is like, we grew up on it. We can attribute so many highs and lows of our lives that are just tied into going home that day and playing Dota. But it's it's just always going to be special. My, my only concern when it comes to Dota is not the longevity in the next five years, but what the game will look like in 10, 15, 20 years. That, that's what would concern me. I don't think anybody knows. Yeah. I don't think Valve knows himself. Uh, it's hard to it's, say. It's very hard, you know? It's very hard yeah. to say. I think that for me, right now, contemplating five years is as far as I can look. It's as far as I can see. Mm -hmm. But honestly, five years ago, did we really think that Dota was going to be around by now? We don't know. It's been <sighs> yeah. a strange thing. I mean, people have been saying dead game for, what, eight years now? And the game's still around, so... <laughs> Yep. It's probably not going to die, but I mean, it's not gonna die. For, the, for the most part, I, I do think that it is important to have people who are passionate about Dota making content for Dota, because so long as there are like online creators or orgs willing to turn out interesting things, podcasts, talk shows, uh, content with their teams, people like Jenkins, right? Who puts funny videos on YouTube and is always putting up it. People like BSJ, who's always turning out content, Gork. These people are so vital and important. 
to the mm-hmm. community, even though a lot of them often feel like because like you, if you sorry i'm like rambling but if you zoom out and you look at them in terms of broadcasting people are like oh yeah i hate jenkins blah blah he doesn't he's not funny that's just one idiot right but there are so many people from his youtube channel who wouldn't typically like dota as much but because the way he makes his content it's so genius and it's just so hilarious and it's so digestible for someone who isn't obsessed with dota and doesn't really care about the competitive scene so much but they still love dota right they feel like they're a part of it we need to have people like this who are willing to create a levity in their content and not just oh esports everybody tradition at a specific, you know, in- specific market you know but i think that we do need more creators in dota i feel like it, it, it is important to have people like this so i mean this year i was considering making my content for dota because i've been so focused on broadcasting but it is something that i thought about uh, if i'm scared dota's gonna die maybe i should do more for dota myself so probably gonna try to make videos or something sometime this year or, or just if dota dies i'll have a clear conscience you know what i mean i can say that i tried that i i tried to give back to the community so that's obviously still gonna be a work in progress i still have to figure out the logistics of it but i don't plan on just sitting back and only doing analyst work this year okay that sounds amazing you should do more things i think people yeah. would really enjoy it Mira, I'm going to let you go. Uh, this is great. I really have to do the, we have to figure out something else to do. And I know I've been saying this for a year, but <laughs> there's a lot of things going on in my life yeah. that stop me from doing it. But let, uh, look, uh, last thoughts for me, it's always a pleasure having you and Kyle. I wish I had more time with you in person as well, because I still haven't met you, believe it or not. So soon, hopefully soon. soon. <laughs> it was a great talk. Thank you for having me. Uh, hopefully we can do this again. Don't be shy. Just be like, Effie, get your ass on a call and then I'll, I'll get on. Awesome. I'll hold you okay. to that. Goodbye. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Goodbye.